to John McDonnell MP for his morning with us. Since 1997, John has been a member of Parliament for Hayes and Harlington in West London. Before that, he was a member of the Greater London Council, head of the Policy Unit at Camden Borough Council, chief executive of the Association of London Authorities, and chief executive of the Association of London Government. Throughout his working life, he has been a committed trade unionist. A, recent, a significant recent initiative has been the People's Parliament, to which John has invited the general public and a wide range of speakers to the House of Commons to debate, to debate the kinds of policy that we're going to need in the future. In March, the Citizens Aid and Trust has ceased to be able to participate in the People's Parliament event on citizens' income. John is going to speak to us on the subject, Citizens' Income, Politically Feasible. Thank you. Thank you. Now let me apologise in advance. I'm trapped between um, Guy Standing, who's one of the uh, inspirational teacher, uh, uh, who's taught me a lot about uh, the citizen income or basic income he described, and his work internationally, which I'm eternally grateful for. And Natalie Bennett, who's going to take us on to a high plane as well with regard to the sustainable economy. I'm going to bring you down to grubby politics. So I apologise for that. There's only one disagreement I have with Guy. Is I, I don't think we should be a derogatory to Ian Duncan Smith. Um, I think he's done more um, in causing absolute chaos in the social security system <laughs> to advance the cause of citizens' income than any other politician. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I just say to Malcolm as well, uh, when I had Malcolm and I grew up this agenda, I can see it just shows the confidence of the organisation that I'm speaking on citizens' income, political fees, but there isn't a question mark at the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me, I just want, as I say, I'm going to bring you down to grubby politics. I want to talk about what, where we go from here in terms of political strategy. Um, last night I spoke at Tony Benham's commemoration, the organised by Stop the War. And like Guy, Tony used to advocate um, that theory of political change, which was um, you produce an idea, and first of all, um, you're described as bad. And then when it starts to get some purchase, you're then denigrated as mad. And then eventually, Tony has would always say, then you can find no one in the world who doesn't claim it for their own, yeah. eventually. And I think that's where we're at in terms of citizens' income. I genuinely do think we're on a tipping point. When, when I was a student, we used to study thing under the Kuhn's theory of scientific revolution. And there was always that tipping point where the problematic suddenly changed. And I think we're on the edge of that now. Largely because of the political situation we're in, and also the chaos, as I say, that Ian Duncan Smith has, has caused or wherever he goes, really. Um, I think the good news is that there's a sort of a vacuum that's emerging in terms of the debate around a number of issues, poverty, welfare, social security, of course, also the debate around citizenship as well, which someone drew out today. And it is the debate around how you bring those all together in terms of an e overall economic strategy as, as well. Um, so that's the good news. Uh, the bad news, really, is that it's my view is not going to be easy to insert citizen income into that gap, and it's not going to be immediate or overnight. But there is, I think, just a critical window of opportunity over this next 18 months to two years. And why, does it, why is the, the, this opportunity? Well, it's been mentioned earlier, this is a statement of the obvious. The economic crisis opened up and revealed the economic system, the politically well, and socially and economically, not just grotesquely inefficient, but actually corrupt. I always use that analogy of the Wizard of Oz, you know, when they eventually get at the end of that yellow brick road to see the wizard, and then all of a sudden the curtain is pulled behind, cut across, and the, the wizard is revealed as just a man pulling a whole range of levers, microphones, etc. And that's what happened in the economic crisis. When the curtain was pulled across from the city of London, you realise not only were they corrupt, not only were they incompetent, but they never understood the system either. The algorithms, they never knew either. And there was some poor PhD student pumping these out on a regular basis that they were speculating on. And it revealed, I think, to the general public and most people in the country, the political system was corrupt and inefficient as well because it allowed this to happen. The, um, the lack of regulation, the encouragement of the free market. So the whole system played. And there was that opportunity during the crisis so expose all, in all its gory detail the incompetence, the inefficiency, the unjustness and the unfairness in all its detail. Most people thought at that point in time that's when people 
will revolt against the system. It's at that stage when you hit the bottom that people will then demand change. I don't think that's ever the case. I actually think at that point in time, people are just too busy trying to survive. But in addition to that, initially they'll turn to the existing institutions and the existing policies, and they'll expect them to pull them out of the crisis itself. So I think that's not the time when actually we would expect fundamental change to be debated and to be achieved. I think it comes actually not in the depths of the crash, it comes, ironically I suppose, when we're coming out of the recession itself. I think people start looking seriously for change um, when they feel that that's slightly bit more secure. When issues are being debated more widely and there's, there's that room to debate them because you're just emerging from, from the crisis itself. But when they're not seen, that they personally are sharing in, sharing in the end of the recession and the growth and the distribution of the rewards of coming out of that recession. And what's interesting, all the figures that have, have come forward is that over the, since the last 18 months, 95% of the benefits of coming out of the recession has gone to the top 10%. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the period in which the real questions start being asked and options open up. And there's three options, aren't there, from a politically that's, um, that have emerged. First of all, the continuation of everything as before, so it's clinging on to existing institutions and the policies of programs, and that's the coalition government policies plus an element within the Labour Party as well, so it's just going on as before. There's a second option, and that's the politics of uh, despair and division. Uh, and that's the politics of Ukraine, basically. You find a scapegoat, because people are desperate, and you identify that scapegoat, and you use xenophobia, nationalism, and racism to garner support and offer that element of a solution to people. But there's another element, which is the politics of hope and solidarity. And I think that's the politics that's emerging. And it's emerging, and you can, uh, you can get the cast of actors together if you want. Sections of the traditional Labour Party, yes, within it, although there's still neoliberals there. The Greens, elements within the Lib Dems who are now completely dissatisfied with the coalition. Wider elements within the civil society, and social movements in particular. And I think there's an emerging alliance around the politics of hope and solidarity. And I think that's where we've got to focus in this campaign. That's our, that's our target group. I think the Citizens' Income campaign now needs to insert itself into that place where there is politics of hope and solidarity emerging. And I think that emerging alliance is the vehicle which we can either use to ensure we're not just on the agenda but actually becomes a government policy itself. Let me just run through then those elements of the alliance itself and some ideas on how we should address them. Someone mentioned they were in sales. <laughs> and, uh, and that was also mentioned I was on the GLC. When I was elected to the GLC in 81, which was a long time ago, um, we, were on, we were supposedly on the radical left. And at that point in time, um, we had a discussion about how do we promote our ideas which were not particularly popular. Um, issues around gender equality, uh, particularly with regard to uh, issues around homophobia, equality on lesbian and gays, but deeply unpopular, we had a campaign against it. We were raising issues then, uh, which were on, then seen as on, on the margins. And we were also mobilizing around investment in public services, on the transport, which is in bed, etc. Which we had the whole of the ma national media against us, and the evening standard, that wonderful virtue of truth <laughs> and justice, etc. Um, took delight in trying to bring, bring us down. And I was given responsibility for the GRC campaign. So we looked at what modern mechanisms of marketing and sales could we use at that point in time. So we brought together, and I think we're the first political group in that brought in a, a marketing agency, BMP, and Bill Massey and Pollard. And we were polling on a daily basis, on a daily basis. And I hate the expenditure, but we were spending money beyond our wildest dreams. And it wasn't to ask people what did they want, but it was actually saying this is what we want to do, what do you think about it? And it was also about testing, it was testing the words and the way in which we would promote that idea. And in marketing terms, it was theme and scheme. 
We had a theme, which was about redistribution of wealth and power within London that was based upon investment in public services, giving people a voice at County Hall, making sure that we democratised decision making. How did we scheme that? And we sat down and we used the polling to develop that scheme. It was well in advance of Peter Mandelson that ever, ever heard of focus groups. <laughs> and I wish he hadn't, but there you are. <laughs> but it wasn't going to groups to say, what do you want us to say? It was, this is what we want to do, and how can we say it? And how can we convince you? And I think that's where we're at in terms of this campaign at the moment. And I think it does need some very, very serious discussions around the concept, overcoming the arguments, as Guy <laughs> said, that was thrown against us, but more importantly, getting that theme and scheme together about how we go forward. The other thing is how do you win elections? Well, you win elections by putting together coalitions. Uh, and you put together coalitions of a whole range of people on a spectrum who, who you believe should have an interest in this particular policy or idea, and you put that coalition together. So our campaign in this coming period must be around developing the theme and scheme of marketing the idea, and then marketing it to a coalition that we believe that can be they need, uh, build popular support for its implementation. Let me just go through a sort of systematic program of intervention with regards to the, that coalition. With regard, let me come to the Labour Party, because we all have a cost of there. Um, <laughs> at the moment, let's be honest with each other, there's a view that the Labour Party has lost momentum. Mm. And I think that's a deeply uh, felt view within the, the party itself. Um, it's not offering anything new. But what's interesting, though, when it does, it actually picks up popular support. Its problem at the moment is like walking on ice. It's like walking on ice, ice over pond and their fear that spring is coming. So any broadband will not move on an issue until it's absolutely safe. <laughs> but when he does move, it's interesting whether it's on energy prices or bankers' bonuses or murder, actually he picks up massive popular support and massively increases his support within the polls itself. So our job is therefore on any issue now, I say this to me, Justin, our job is to make an issue safe for the Labour Party to move on. It's a reversal of leadership. We've got to become the leaders because the leadership can't lead. And I think that, that our whole approach at the moment is to make this issue safe for them. And that means inserting ourselves into that debate in the policy forums, in the conference resolutions, in the papers around the manifesto, inserting ourselves into that debate around these issues, around the pressures that are on the Labour Party now to come up with some program or some policies which addresses the basic what, or what Guy calls the precarious, right? basically the, the social insecurity that they have within our society itself. And it is based, that insecurity is based upon that inability of large sections of our community to simply survive, take a roof over their heads, feed their children, ensure that they can actually live some form of decent quality of life. I think that's where the Labour Party at the moment is bereft of ideas, and that's why I think this idea could be inserted into that debate, gain popular support, and I said the 400,000 signatures on, with virtually, I have to say, limited effort, limited resources, demonstrating that there is the potential of support out there, but it has to be one that has to be campaigned for. And it is about the convincing of the policy advisors and the think tanks as well. I think Neil was here earlier, Neil Wilson. Uh, again, it's, it's working with groups like Compass, like IPPR, Labour List and all those other vehicles that there are to actually get that message out and to engage in that debate. But to engage in it in a way where organisations not convinced at the moment can throw those hard questions and we can then develop the answers themselves. What about the Lib Dems? What about the Lib Dems? <laughs> I think they know now they're facing a cataclysm. Last night was just another example of that. But I think there's a large number of good people within the Lib Dems at the moment who realise that and are waking up to it. And are now looking for a discussion on a wider basis of not just where do they go as a party, but some of them where do they go as individuals as well and on what issues they should take their stand. And I think this is one of them that will be attractive to a large number of Lib Dem members, councillors, even MPs that we could engage in this debate. Because they need to be seen some, to do something that virtually rehabilitates them in the eyes of their own members, let alone in the eyes of the general public. <coughs> the Greens are here. Let me just say this, if, if, if this as expected after the next general election, we could be in a situation where we're in a, a hung parliament as well. The Greens could play a key role, even if, even if it's just Caroline, but maybe more. 
working with elements within the Lib Dems, or certainly elements on the left of the Labour Party, of making sure that this issue is on the agenda of any talks that come around a coalition forming government. Now, I think, again, the Greens have a key role in this, both in terms of proselytizing the idea, but also just making sure that any negotiations that take place, this is one of those elements that will be on the agenda. The same with the left of the Labour Party. I think those post-election talks could be important for us. It might be, and I throw this out really, it might be that if we put it on the agenda, our compromise will be that we have to have a very short, sharp, new beverage type of examination of where we're going on the whole issue of social security and social welfare, of which this becomes an element of it. And that wouldn't be difficult for the Labour leadership to concede at this point in time, or certainly after an election which is indecisive. Finally, let me run through the last five minutes. In terms of, let me go on. So, Di mentioned trade unions elsewhere. Don't underestimate the role of trade unions in this country. Don't underestimate them because one and a half million people will be out on strike on July 10th. They're mobilizing again. Every time I've spoken at a trade union conference this year, PCS and etc., I'm at the break of this weekend, and I've raised the issue of citizens' income. First of all, people have been querulous, what is it? And then, secondly, when you explain it, support it. Why? Because their members are faced with this <coughs> crisis of income but they realize actually in many ways that old forms of negotiation are not working for them, so they have to have alternatives to reinforce their negotiating powers and with less place for trade union rights. So I think this will be wildly popular with trade unions. <coughs> Can you imagine getting the traditional mechanisms I know for a resolution through an organization like Unite, which is now recruiting committee members, not just members at work, so therefore it's relevant to those that have no income, get it to unite, then onto the TUC, and then we have a consolidated position on citizens' income <coughs> for the trade union movement that still represents six to eight million people in this country. I think that could be an achievement that we look at. Finally, let me say this, the social movements. Don't underestimate the influence for social movements. Three years ago, I was at the founding conference of Disabled People Against the Cuts, and also the Black Triangle was set up in, 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 um, in Scotland. A, a, a small group of people who came together who said, we are, we are suffering at the moment. The, the WCA, the Work Capability Assessment, undertaken up by the private company Atos, is not only just imposing a brutal system on us, it's actually resulting in a number of people with disabilities actually committing suicide. And we challenge this to the evidence that. What they do is they mobilize a campaign. They've got now got a, a dis disability movement in this country that we've never seen before. The results, the results, Atos has had to withdraw from the contract. It's given up a, a, a contract which they were making millions and millions of pounds. Why? because the disabled people in the DPAC Black Triangle were occupying their offices on a regular basis. <laughs> Recruited Paralympic um, contestants actually in their campaign and chastised them publicly and as a result of that destroyed basically the company's involvement in, in, in that um, part of the social security system. Don't underestimate the women's movement that's on the march again to campaign for wages for housework for years old but suddenly been reinvigorated as a concept. Why can't people be paid for looking after their children? and undertaking social duties that are the essential requirements of our society. And civil society, I just say this, the poverty lobby is still there, I don't like that description, but the poverty lobby is still there and working incredibly hard and, and, is, and is forming new alliances now. The religious groups, I remember the Jubilee Debt campaign, which is incredibly powerful. If we inserted this sort of issue around those campaigning organizations, having priests yet again preaching from pulpits, about the issue in the same way they did to do with the eco debt campaign, I think we could really get a resonance with the wider society. So the conclusion I've got is this. One, I think there's enormous potential. Two, I think the time has come. I think guys are right. I'm not with really the way I know 30 years, by the way, but I think the time <laughs> has come. <laughs> but I think we need a number of things. First of all, I think we need a seriousness of intent now. A real seriousness of intent. Secondly, we need to be professional in our approach. Not expect overnight success, but be confident. And above all else, be exciting, enthusiastic. I think this is almost a new generation initiative amongst a whole range of new generation ideas that are coming because everything else has failed. Thanks very much. Good morning so far. Now I did mention I'm going to have a comfort break now.
because otherwise we're sitting for a two and a half hours, which is quite uncomfortable. Can we get that?